Um, I'd like, now like to invite Bob Schmidt to the podium. Where's Bob? There he is. Bob is from Abbott Laboratories and he's going to present on a high throughput approach to delivering compounds to evolving drug discovery departments. Um, yeah, I did change the title from what's in the, in the, out, uh, the uh, brochure there to add cherry picking because I wanted to, to focus on that piece of the, the work we're doing. Um, take you through a little bit of history on how we developed this system. Um, in my group, which is a compound management group, we don't do plate prep. We have another group that was formerly part of high throughput screening that does that. Uh, but we wanted to take the systems that they were using and, and uh, improve upon what they had. And so I'll give you a little history of that, talk about the containers we're using, the automated store itself, um, how we are supporting our clients, and um, some of the quality assurance uh, approaches we have to take, and then go briefly over the results. So the, the history of our liquid store system really dates back to 1999, um, when we had the problem that at that point, we, everything we were doing was powder dispensers, and we did about 80,000 a year. And with four technicians doing about 20,000 powder dispensers a year, we knew we were going to be very rate limited. All I had to do was look in the database and see how things had been expanding. Um, the use of the powder inventory had been expanding and the, the rate at which we were dispensing compounds was becoming an exponential curve. It started very flat and then within a few years it was just going up very quickly. I could easily extrapolate just from that curve um, that we would have a tenfold increase in the amount of work we would have to do in dispersals within 10 years. Um, that has proved to be wrong. We are actually beyond tenfold increase in 10 years. Um, not by much, but I thought we would be really pressed to get to 10, th 10, th I'm sorry, 10 times the amount of dispersals. We've actually exceeded that in the 10 years. And improvements in the way people do their dispensing, I thought, well, we could get to maybe 25,000 per person per year, but that would translate to 32 technicians. Now, if you have money, you don't have to be creative. You just hire people. There's no way I was going to get 32 technicians. So we had to come up with creative approaches. We also noticed the amount of powder being requested was going down. Um, it had been over five milligrams per request in the earlier years, and then it was getting down to one to three milligrams, and then one milligram less. So um, we thought, well, that's working in our favor, but what's working against this is the physical properties of the compounds we were working with. As you all know, we're getting more and more difficult. The crystalline compounds weren't being produced the way they had been historically. And we couldn't find automation that was suitable for weighing out small quantities of those types of compounds. Even to this day, we haven't found something effective. So what we came up with as our original proposal was to have two different stores. Um, the high throughput screening group had a liquid library. We supplied them and they did all the plate prep. But um, we wanted to, to take that into the compound management group. And originally we wanted to have a frozen store for the stock solutions and a room temperature store for a working plate. And we thought, well, the store that um, we would keep the stock solutions in should be frozen at minus 10. The working plate would be at room temperature. Um, we could then store first, format later, on demand. You can tell us what kind of output container you want, whether it's a plate or a vial, what volume you want, what concentration you want, and we would make it on demand. That was the original intent. We would want to then replace the working plate whenever we depleted um, from that stock solution that we stored frozen. And when we proposed this to upper management, the VP of re research said, this sounds like a great idea, but I don't want it to be a multi-million dollar experiment and then have it fail. Go do the stability study. Find out if we can do this. So we initiated a stability study that took us about two years to run. We found very little information in the literature at the time. And that was really, I think, because 
people were doing studies, but they didn't feel necessarily they were publishable. So we could talk with people at meetings like this and anecdotally get information, but we needed something more um, solid, scientifically solid that we could bank our, our decisions on. So we recognized a comprehensive study is difficult to run. You need a lot of compounds and a lot of each compound to do it effectively. But we put together a team, went through our collection, said which compounds are diverse enough to be um, representative of what we see in a typical screening library today and we, that we have plenty of. Um, unfortunately, the only ones we had plenty of were the nice crystalline compounds, so we biased our study a little bit in that direction. Um, but we did go ahead and run it on just about um, a thousand different compounds. Started at 10 millimolar, tested all these different storage conditions. We wanted to look at temperature and its effects, the effect of oxygen, moisture, um, glass versus polypropylene, because we didn't know if we should, if we should try to focus on glass, materi glass storage materials for everything or just um, you know, bite the bullet and go with, with polypropylene. Freeze-thaw cycles were a big question mark in our mind at the time, too. The results that came out of this, um, we found that in, in the study we did, the temperature alone affected the kinetics enough that room temperature was not really good for beyond six months. And the way we set our threshold was 80% of the compounds that we started with had to have 80% or better of their original concentration. And if they dropped below that threshold, if we had fewer than 80%, we said that was our, our shelf life. So it turned out to be right around six months. But when we stored at minus 10 degrees, we could go extrapolating out. We could go well beyond ten, uh, eight years, eight to 10 years. We found that oxygen really wasn't a problem for us. Most of the compounds in our collection are not oxygen reactive, and those that are probably would have already reacted by the time we got to use them in a screening campaign anyway. Um, I, as most people know, water is the big problem. How do we keep out water without uh, going to environments that are, for example, nitrogen or argon environments that are completely dry when our safety organization wouldn't allow that? Um, that not any kind of a, of a store where people could walk in, could be in an inert environment. We surprisingly found that polypropylene was a little better than glass. We had some reactive groups on the glass that were causing uh, some degradation effects in some of our compounds. We did not see that nearly as much with the polypropylene. It wasn't a huge difference, but it made us feel much more comfortable going with polypropylene as a storage container. And then we looked at freeze-thaw cycles, and we found at 10 millimolar, that really wasn't much of an issue. Um, we did have some anecdotal information from other companies, one at 20 millimolar, one at 2 millimolar, and freeze-thaw cycle problems sent, tended to track concentration. Higher concentration, more likely you'd precipitate out as you went through your freeze-thaw cycles with your little microenvironments. This was all published in a paper which has been referenced now many times um, back in 2003. And uh, we're really happy that so many people have taken up pieces of that, that problem and looked into it more in depth. We wish we had had the benefit of some of that when we were going through our work. But um, that's really been a, a great thing for, for all of us to see more of this in-depth study on, on compound stability. I think. It's helped us all refine the way we do things. So out of this, we realized the working store at room temperature wasn't going to work. We had to come up with a new solution. So we went ahead with this approach. Format first, then store. That meant we had to pre-aliquot everything. Um, I'm not a believer in plate storage. I, I prefer tube storage. It gives us the most flexibility. So we went with these aliquots in individual tubes. Five millimolar concentration, that was a practical decision. The compound library, solvated library that was in the screening group was at five millimolar. And we realized if we could bring those compounds back and populate our liquid store, we would save years of work weighing out from powder. 
So we went with a 5 millimolar concentration, a stock volume of 350 microliters, and then eight aliquots at 20 microliters each. That also was a practical consideration. We asked people, what kind of volume and concentration do you want? And everybody came back with 10 millimolar, 10 microliters. Not always could justify why, but that's what they wanted to do. So we said, well, we'll give you the same number of moles of compound at 5 millimolar. And so far, that's been pretty much acceptable to everybody. We get a little pushback on the 5, micro, uh, five millimolar, but not too much. So we went with the individual tubes. Store them at minus 20. We decided the colder the better, and the, the manufacturers of the storage system said they could go down to about minus 20. Um, so we said, let's do that. It's better than the temperature we ran our stability study at, so we, we felt comfortable doing that. Went with polypropylene containers, and this is what they look like. This is the 96 well stock solution container. You can see right here, this is one of them sitting on edge. Not a particularly good picture of it, but that's about maybe 1.3 centimeters in height. It'll hold about 500 microliters total, 450 maybe. So it's got the two-dimensional barcode on the bottom, and we use that just for stock solutions. This is what the tubes are like for the 384 plate. Um, they'll hold 40 microliters. They're individually sealed. Um, I just have a, a plate here showing one of the maps that we use. To, we can put them into different positions, um, put, create plate maps that will we'll leave open locations here for us. And some of the design objectives, we really, really, really wanted to hit a high throughput. Five, I'm mean, sorry, 50,000 tube, movement, tube movements a day. That means compounds going in or compounds coming out. Um, and in order to do that, we went with the, the RTS system. Um, it has 126 pins, each under individual control. It can hold 25 million of the 384-way tubes and 2.5 and million of the stock solution tubes. Because the 384 tubes are single use, we said we're not going to go with barcodes. We had that option, but the tubes are more expensive and they're, they're more likely um, going to be problems reading those little tiny barcodes. So we didn't want to have additional technical challenges to face with that. Um, so we use a vision system to verify the pick and place movement. We do have the 2D barcodes on the 96-way tubes. And what we do is we make eight aliquots of each compound. So we start in a 96-well format and produce the 384-well plates with uh, four copies in each plate of each compound. And then we make two plates like that. But when they go into the store, they're not stored in those plates. What we do is we separate them all out. So physically, you never have two of the same aliquot, or I'm sorry, two of the same compound on one storage tray. And the storage trays are higher density than the, the plate itself. So we can, we can pack a lot of tubes into one storage tray and use up all the available real estate on it. And then a key challenge um, or objective was to integrate with our in-house manage data management system. Um, it's a, something we've built in our own uh, company. And we wanted to be sure that it communicated very easily and effectively with the, the um, liquid store. And then we wanted to be able to put plate layout maps in at, at will. So we could send a plate map over and have it lay out the, the compounds that it picked in that map and then output them that way. So this is a picture of the picking head, the picking station. It's got five tray handlers here and an upper picking head right here and there's a lower one that looks very similar to it underneath. So pins come up from the bottom, drive the tubes out of the rack into this upper head, then that moves over to the destination and pins there drive them down. The plates enter way over here on the side. There's a cytomat uh, carousel system and a diving board. And this device here comes over. It's kind of a fork-shaped device. It's holding a rack right now. 
it pivots on this point. So it'll come around here, pick up a plate, bring it all the way back here, and then there's grippers on that head that will pick it up and move it onto one of these uh, trays. If we were bringing in the 96 well plates, it would be held here by these forks, but right over this plate reader. So we could read all the barcodes and verify those um, barcodes before we, we moved any of the tubes. You see a closer look at the head. Um, you can see right here the gripper for the 96 way tubes. These are the grippers here and here that swing down and grab a plate to move it. And then you see one of the storage trays here. You can see how the tubes fill all the way out to the edges of this storage plate. And here's a video. I hope I have time for this, about two minutes. Um, showing you the operation of it. Take about two minutes. So what you're seeing now is tray handler is pulling a rack out from the, um, the, the picking robots behind it. And now it's verifying what's in each location. When you see the red lights go on, that's the vision system checking locations to see what locations are filled and which ones are empty. Now what it's doing is it's picking tubes from here and going over and placing them over here. And it can pick up to 126 tubes and then it dispenses, um, it, it, it picks randomly I guess you might say, but then it dispenses as quickly as it can all of those tubes in there. At the same time it's doing that, the store robot is bringing in or taking away more of the, the trays that it's, it's using to supply inventory or taking them back when they're finished. This thing picks um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, most of the time now. It's, we had some um, challenges up front with that, but right now it's been pretty reliable. And what you see now is it's picking up more compounds from way over there. It's going to do a, a quick vision check and then bring them over to this side where it'll, it'll drop them off. So it's picking up from each of those trays, each of those individual racks on that storage tray, as many of the tubes as it can get before it comes over and does a dispense. So here's the dispense action and then and we stop. Okay, some of the technical challenges we had. Reliability at minus 20 um, can be a bit of a problem. We had some contraction rates with the different types of plastic in there that weren't even. And so we had some molded parts um, that would be slightly different in, in their dimensional stability than, than some of the other parts um, that were made of metal. And so we had a, a bit of a problem early on with that, but that, that's been resolved now. We also found a problem with cables that um, there's one particular type of cable that we see um, problems with um, after a few years of use that doesn't handle the cold real well. So we're working on new solutions with the vendor for that. The vision system was a little tricky. Um, it, it's been pretty much resolved now, though we, we still would like to have it work a lot faster than it does. But that took a while to optimize. And the picking algorithms were a little bit of a challenge at first. We were not getting anywhere near the kind of throughput we wanted, so we've been working with the vendor. And we still want to do some additional tweaking on that, but we're getting much better. And then we had some problems with the, the data handling. All these have pretty much now been resolved, and I'll tell you the easiest way to get a problem resolved by the vendor is to have your temperature of the tube store turned way down, and then tell them they have to go in there until it's fixed and at minus 20 degrees, they come up with solutions. They just keep the door locked. <coughs> we also found that loading 500,000 compounds takes a long time, especially when there's eight copies of each. And in the early days when we had run stop at night, we just come in in the morning and uh, it stopped an hour after people left or something like that. We would have to restart the run and and that was really kind of frustrating, but 
Um, out of it, we've got some interesting little software tools that allowed one of my, my staff members to view the operation from home. And he lived nearby, so if it shut down early enough in the evening, he could run in and, and restart it. We had some problems with tubes dropping or not being picked properly, not being placed properly, or errors like that. These are all the growing pains of working with a new technology, a new system. And I think most of that now has been pretty much resolved and under control, but it, it presented challenges and delayed our, our implementation. And then final problem, integration with the compound management software. There's always things you didn't expect, always things that came up at the last minute that kind of uh, throw a wrench into the works we had to deal with. So the customers of the Liquid Library, now that we've resolved that, um, you know, got it in online now. We've, we've got all the backlog loaded. Everything is, is pretty much routine production now. Our high throughput screening. We're, we're able to remove now the old TCAN liquid library systems that they've been using for several years. There's the hit to lead teams now that can come to us and say, we want to do rapid analoging around these hits that we're working on. Um, we can do that much more effectively than we could before. High throughput ADME is a group that we've really been pushing to move to this format because they like to use much larger volumes. Um, and just within the last month, they've reformatted all of their assays so they can now use the liquid store samples as a source for them, which has been, been a great help to us. Fragment-based screening, which we call SAR by NMR at Abbott. Um, this is a group that we would like to move on to it. Um, probably won't be able to because their concentration needs are higher, but we're still working with them to see what we can do. And then the therapeutic area project teams that we've been supplying either solvated on-demand compounds or even powder compounds for all these years. We would now, we're trying to move them into the mode of taking compounds from the, the liquid store. But like I said, we're not a plate prep group. So we don't do the final preparation. What we do is we hand the plates off if they want them in a different format to a new group that formerly had been just dedicated to high throughput screening prep work. They are now reformed as a discovery wide prep group. They will take the output of our liquid store, reformat them uh, into whatever plate or vial type the, the end user wants. They can make assay ready plates for them um, in any volume or concentration below what we, we supply. They'll do dilution series plates. What we do is we make the output plate from our system in columns that they can then use as the, the starting template for their serial dilutions. And they're using an echo for nanoliter volumes. So they take that 20 microliters and they can extend its use to multiple end users. High throughput screening has really changed the way they approach screening now. As several speakers have talked about already, there's been this change from screening everything to trying to be more targeted in the way we screen. And that was why we wanted this pick rate of 50,000 per day because we want to be able to create libraries on demand for them and have them screen anywhere from say 25 or 30,000 compounds up to hundreds of thousands of compounds without having to wait months for us to get the, the compounds into their hands. And we wanted it to be a cherry picking operation so they weren't restricted to only the compounds that showed up on particular plates. So we can now give them a really broad coverage of the library. They typically screen about um, 450,000 compounds in each of the typical primary screens. But then they can do hit explosion for follow-up assays, or they can have specialty screening sets that run anywhere from 30 to 150 or 200,000 compounds. Um, we also are able to prepare IC50 dilution plates for them in much faster fashion than they could get before and with much higher quality because their old liquid library, the compounds were compromised by not having good seals on them and so they were picking up moisture from the air. And they were sitting at room temperature for a year or more. So we knew they had some degradation there. 
Another benefit for our biologists is they can now say, I've got a couple different assay formats and I'm not sure which is the better way to go. And before they would test them with a few dozen or a few hundred compounds. Now we can give them sets of thousands of compounds that are more representative of the screening collection. And they can do a better assessment of which compound, or I'm sorry, which assay will work for their, their uh, target, which has been a, a big help to them. And as I said, 20 microliters is more than most groups need for assay-ready plates. So we're looking at how can we extend that using this ECHO. They're now buying a, something called an ECHO pod in the PREPS group where we will store these 20 microliters for multiple dispensers from that echo pod into assay ready plates for the different uh, therapeutic area teams. Um, all right, so even at 20 degrees centigrade, we know that after around 10 years, we'll probably be at this 80% threshold. We just don't know which compounds are gonna degrade. So we've been working with our structural chemistry group, and they've come up now with uh, a new probe for their NMR that can work with these 20 microliter, five millimolar samples. So what we're gonna do is when a compound hits 10 years of age, we're gonna pull an aliquot and send a plate over to the structural chemistry group, and they will evaluate. And at, um, the output of their evaluation, we'll know if we have to pull the rest of those aliquots out and discard them, or if we can just reset the clock and say, all right, we'll give you another five years uh, on these compounds and then test them again. And um, we're just getting that ramped up now. We've been doing testing with the new probe and um, it looks very promising. So the results, in our first year of operation, about a half a million dispensers. And coupled with about 300,000 powder dispensers, that got us to our 800,000 um, number of dispensers in a year. This year we will have, hit, have between 1.2 and 1.5 million dispensers out of this store. And we're already well over 500,000. The one thing that we're still really pushing the vendor on is the hit rate. Um, we'd like to get to that 50,000 mark. The best we've done so far is 33,000, but we're now into incremental changes. So we're tweaking at this point, but we think we'll get there. We know that physically it can do it. It's picked over 70,000 in a day during certain tests we've run. It's just when it has to tra uh, bring trays in and out, it, it's, it's in that operation that we see it sit and wait sometimes and we want to eliminate those, those wait times. And the vision system we would like to get a little faster so that it doesn't delay the, the picking. We also haven't loaded the stock solutions yet. Um, we just finished all the backlog of our, of our three to four well aliquot loading. So we're gonna begin this now. Um, loading takes a second priority to picking. Um, so we've been focusing on getting all these different groups their, their compounds as quickly as we could. Now we're at the point where we can start loading the, the stock solutions. And because of this, as I mentioned, the screening paradigms have changed. We've now enabled them to do things very differently than they did before with much better um, throughput and hopefully better quality results. And the discovery scientists are now being educated on what they'll need to do to run their samples in this format. And um, it will become their primary source. And we're gonna start dialing back on the number of custom solubilizations we do for them. And certainly we wanna back down on the number of powder dispensers we do. We'll still have those available because there will still be times when that's the, 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 the most appropriate type of sample for them. But we wanna make sure that it becomes a secondary so, uh, source of compounds. So a lot of our prep uh, work in, in the, the lab, my technician's work, is now focused on getting those compounds as soon as they enter the lab into the um, liquid store. And we're also in a parallel operation pre preparing the samples for the high throughput ADME group. So everything comes in, it's queued up right away, and we can put in um, compounds 
before the, the assay teams um, even know we have them sometimes. So, any questions? <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned the software integration, uh, uh, the liquid store integration with the software as a challenge. Can you precise uh, what issues uh, you faced? And do you plan to go further with this uh, integration? The user interface? Is that what you said? Yes, the interface between the component management software and the liquid store. Yeah, the way we did the interface is we set up um, shared table space in Oracle. So our our compound management system writes the request to the, the table, and all we request is the lot of sample. We don't ask for a specific aliquot. We just say, this is the lot we want. Then the RTS software takes that list, and then it optimizes its picking routine based on which aliquots can be most, uh, which which grouping of aliquots will give them the, the most picks on a single tray. And so it, it pulls in the first tray, picks all those compounds, goes on to the next one. And so it's dynamically looking at which lot is the best lot, I'm sorry, which aliquot of a lot is the best aliquot to pick to get to this, this high hit rate. Is that answering your question? Yes, and now you consider that it is uh, fixed and uh, everything is... Uh Sorry? Okay. Do you consider now that uh, it is uh, okay? It is uh, the yeah. integration is uh, finished, is it's uh, achieved. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It works very well, actually. Any other questions? Hans. Hi. I wonder. Um, do you see any benefit with having the sample prep group separated from the compound management group? You know, it's always been part of the high throughput screening group up until about a year ago. We just applied high throughput screening with mother plates and they made all their, their daughter plates there. So there was a discussion just a little over a year ago about where preps really belong. We're all part of the same lead discovery organization the high throughput screening group, compound management, um, fragment screening, chem informatics, and the drug sample room are all part of a group called lead discovery. It was decided at that time to pull the prep group out of screening and make their work available to all of discovery. And the question was, well, should they be part of the compound management area or not? And we thought, well, Let's give it a try as an independent group first and see how that works. And the jury's still out. We don't know if it's really the best way or not. We'll be reevaluating probably over the next six months or so. And then and we can make it work whether it's part of our group or not. That's, that's our objective right now is to work with them as an independent group. But where we really run into the challenges is on data management. Because if they start sending compounds to end users that our compound management system doesn't know about, then we run into the problem when corporate legal group calls us and says, tell us everybody who's ever gotten this particular compound. We can't give them the answer without going to multiple systems. So we're looking at things like that. You know, how do we make sure we can track the compound usage appropriately? Because we have a fiduciary responsibility to the corporation to make sure those compounds are being used properly. And and restricted properly and, and such. Okay, if I can just add the, the Pfizer experience to that at Sandwich, um, the plate provision group to HTS is a separate, separate team to the compound management group, and that works very well. So plate provision is my principal customer, and that works, that works fine. Yeah, okay, any other questions? Sorry, Bob. I was just saying, it's just a matter of making the, the the arrangement work. We can make it work as part of our group, or, or like Terry says, you can make it work as separate groups. We just have to all be on the same page. Ian. Thanks. Um, just a point of clarification. Is it um, 500,000 compounds in your store, or is it more? 
Oh, it's more. More, okay. Um, and the other one was, what are the cycle times? So I'm an assayist, I put an order in, it goes through your system, then it goes to the other groups, and it comes into my assay in what time? If we already have the compound in the liquid store, you can have it in, in one to two days. Um, if we don't have the compound in the store, then you have to add two days to that, assuming that the compound is at our site. The way our, our compound management software works, you can order a compound from any of our sites. And so if we have to wait for it to come over from Germany, for example, obviously there's a, another delay there. Uh, did, just take the question back, then we'll come back to you. Thanks. Um, how do you choose the number of the smaller aliquots? Because you said eight, Terry said 45. Obviously, it depends on the size of the organization, how many people you're serving, but how did you come to the number of eight? We looked at the history of compound dispenses, both from our own database and from what the screening group had done, and found that most compounds were never re requested more than five times in their lifetime. So we chose eight because it's a multiple of four, and it's higher than five. So. And, and 12 takes longer to load, so we decided not to do that. But the stock solution allows us the flexibility to, to add more later. So at the time the, the customer's placing the order, do they know if the compound's going to be on the store or not? It does tell them if it's already stored in the store or if preparation is required. So you don't have to tell them, oh, no, we don't have that one's going to take two extra days. They already know that before they plan their experiment. Well, yes, but... Most people aren't ordering a few dozen compounds. They're ordering a list of hundreds or thousands, so they're not going to go through and check every one. So one of the tools we want to come up with is a summary form before the order gets committed to say, you have this number of compounds that are not in the store. Do you want to include them in your order or not? And if you say not, it'll be, they'll be removed, and you'll get a list of which ones will be removed. If you say yes, and what we do is we split the order into two. One goes directly to the store and we'll fulfill it right away, and the other we'll work on in the, in the, in the future. lab weighing from powder and getting them into the store. Okay, any last question? Okay, thanks very much, Bob. All right, thank you.